Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome. This is Noemi Schoenberger. -Long. I will die, and I am always very careful when I say German because I want you to know that not everybody became a Nazi in Germany. Many of them were killed in their own those people who were killing us were not. As I look at that picture, me and my family, I remember the good times, the warmth, the love, but I also remember the terrible words, the ugly caricatures, which made the mood to many Hungarian to accept the German, the SS Nazi ideology. I found in my father's diary the following quote, we were outcasts. No one protected or cared for us. In the daily newspaper it was written, it is a shame that Jews are breathing the clear air. It is a shame that the sun is rising above them. It is a shame that those hungry enemies are drinking even a drop of water. It is a shame that those we hate the most are eating a piece of bread that is taken from the mouth of good Hungarians. It is a shame that all entertainment, literature, and theater is in the Jews' hands. They are poisoning our air. The mood was set. And so, when the Nazis marched in March 19, 1944, to Hungary, the Hungarian Nazis, the Arrow Cross, greeted them with open arms. But we, the Jewish population, with fear in our heart, we didn't know what's coming. Then came the so-called Jewish laws. The first one they had to wear the yellow star. We didn't have any star at home. We had to go to the store. We had to use our own money. And we had to buy not only one, but then one. Because if we kept outside, the yellow star had to be above our heart. I have here a yellow star. But this is a gift that I was a free woman, and I love them, because I am free. About two weeks later, the creation of the ghetto. We know what ghetto is. Ghetto is a small location where they concentrate people to easily supervise and to bring in people who live on the other part of the city. Our house was on the border line of the ghetto. I remember we looked out the window and we did see the road. The road we went many times. It was still free. The other side of the road where neighbors lived before, they were there but they became strangers, and we became prisoners in our own home, and waiting, what will happen? One day, 
I had a big, huge grand piano. I learned to speak piano since I was five years old. Three men came in without paper, without anything, took out the legs of that piano, put it on their shoulder, and as they were moving, my father asked, what are you doing? We are making room for other people, and they left. But I remember when they were carrying that piano on their shoulder, I felt as somebody would have died. I cried bitterly. I never knew that if I would be that only one, what was taken away from us would be not so bad. But that time was horrible. And then it families were brought in our home. We were crowded because our house was just a small, normal family home. These poor people had to leave everything behind in their house. They bought something with them, but we were so crowded. They were sleeping on the hallway. If they wanted to have one cup of water, they had to stand in line and they, if they had to go to the bathroom in a private home, they had to stand in line. Everybody was nervous, afraid. They were crying, yelling, crying again, even arguing. We didn't have one peaceful minute. And then, Three weeks later came the next order. All able men, from 18 years old up to 50, they have to pack their package, and next day they have to move and leave to the forced labor camp. Later. My father was 48, he had to go. I remember he was packing his backpack my mom helped him, and while she was helping him, my mom was crying the whole day. And then the next day, my father, with tears in his eyes, said goodbye, and my mom couldn't stop crying. And I was the oldest one, and I tried to calm her down, asking her, please don't cry, maybe he comes back soon. She said, no, Amy, I have a terrible feeling that I will never see him again. And I'm so sorry to share with you. She was right. They never met again. They were married for 25 years then. Who lived back in this ghetto? Grandmas, grandpas, young mothers with babies, and younger than I was then. In my family was my grandma, my mom. She was 43 and a half years old. When she was 43 years old, she had a baby. We had a six months old little baby brother. My little sister was 12 and a half, and I was 20 going to 21. Nobody talked to us, surrounded by the Hungarian soldiers. Food got less and less. For three horrible months, we had no idea what will happen to us. And then came the order. All of you has to pack and next day you have to line up in your own backyard. They even told us what to pack. A small pillow, a back sheet, about this size of dry food package. No worries. We were told don't you even try to hide a ring. We will search you. We will find you. And the last one, and you may pack 
one change of underwear. We were just listening, where are we going in this art form? Where is that place? But nobody could ask. And we were happy. Next day, we lined up. We got everything we had. And then we had to march through the whole city with the big yellow star, with the package. And we found ourselves outskirts of that city. And it was a factory there. But nobody, nobody worked there. <coughs> it was empty. But on the ground, in the courtyard, many, many people like us from the countryside. And we didn't know what to do now. We were told that you go up to the second floor. We looked around, we didn't see even a door. Steps up. One of the Hungarian soldiers showed us tall ladders leaning against the wall. And they said, climb. Of course, then I was much younger. I started to climb right away. I was about in the middle, in a curtain. Where is my mom? Where is my grandma? With the baby, the little sister. How are they doing? And I stopped, and I wanted to look back. And this second, I noticed that a soldier was running up after me. He took out his bayonet. Do you know what the bayonet is? The long, silver, sharp-edged tool of war, of killing. And he pushed me right here in the middle of my back. After so many years, I can even feel. And he pushed me so much that I almost fell over. Why? Because I was concerned about my dear Slowly, slowly, everybody got off. It was dirt floor. He settled down in the corner. All facilities done steps. Poor water only, some food, and bathroom. So whenever you had to use all three or one of them, you had to come in that temple level. I tried to help my dear ones, whatever I could. But of course, the bathroom they had to come down. We were there for 10 days. We were horrible. We didn't know what will happen. After 10 days, we were told that we have to get ready. In half an hour, we have to go downstairs, take in the small package with us. You see, they didn't have to tell us twice. As soon as they, they heard that we will leave, we were ready. Human beings have hope. We hope that if we get in the way from here, maybe something better coming. We went down to the Hungarian soldiers greeted us and then they told us go a little bit further. There were the Nazi soldiers. As soon as they took us over, we ceased to be human beings. We became a number. That was the first time we saw the SS eye to eye. Behind the SS stood a long, long train made up of cattle cars. Here became only a number, and 85 of us was pushed into these cattle cars. In the semi-darkness, we couldn't see. We could almost, was hard to stand. We moved around the little bed and then settled down, finally. The SS closed the door from the outside, and we were waiting what's happening. As I looked around, I looked into that side two end of the cattle car when I noticed two buckets of each end. I learned that one of each was for fresh water, 
The other two was for sanitary purposes for 85 people. I always say, if I will be 100 years old, I will never forget that stench in that cattle car. And so, slowly, that cattle car started to move toward our unknown destiny. Inside the car was chaos. The little babies were crying. Their little stomach hurt, among them my little brother. The school age children were asking for their dinner, for their bed, for their toys. And the old ones had a nightmare. They wanted to break out. We had to hold them down. My grandma, during daytime, got up and started to speak to us. I had to think about it a little bit because I want to tell you in Hungarian what she said. It is as nematied as az enyém, és senki se tudja elvenni tőlem. This is Hungarian. Don't worry, I will translate in English. What she was saying was that this is mine, and nobody, but nobody can take it away from me. She repeated about three times. She had nothing in her hand. I got really nervous, and I was really worried because my grandma was so shocked, so really, really intelligent, knowing everything. And she's saying something, and she doesn't have it. I almost gave up. When she bent down, she had a big, huge skirt on. Under it, she must have had a pocket. And slowly, she pulled out this tall, heavy silver candle holder. Everybody became so quiet. They said, not a ring. She's standing there, proudly, happily, <laughs> with the heavy silver candle holder. So what should I do? I know. I gave her a big hug. Then I had to pry away her fingers. One by one, she didn't want to give it to me. Finally, I put it in my own package, and she sat down crying. And I wanted to figure out why on earth she brought that. And then I did. You see, in our religion, there is a tradition that we light the Shabbat candle every Friday night. My dear grandma grew up in this tradition since she was a little girl. She heard the Nazis, no valuable. She dis disregarded it. She had to have her candle holder. When I figured this out, if it is possible, I loved her and respected her even more. She was a courageous, smart old lady. We traveled that way, horrible things happened, eight days. Finally, we stopped. There was a little window, I looked out, there was a train station. On it, two words, one of them was, Oshavitsim, I don't speak Polish, but it sounded that looked like. The other one said Auschwitz, and you know, we didn't know at all what Auschwitz meant. We were happy that the door got open, some fresh air came in, and young Polish prisoner men, <laughs> on the order of the Nazis, told us that we had to get out and leave everything, but everything behind. We got done, we had to line up in a pair, a long, long line, Everybody was tired. I was standing with my mom. She had the baby. Behind me was my grandma and my little sister. And first I didn't see anything what is happening, but all of a sudden I noticed that the top of the line is dividing for some reason. I didn't know why until 
we got on the top. And here I did see on a pedestal one SS officer in a shiny uniform, wide gloves on his hand, and in one a horse whip. And I always say when I get this part, this is not memory. I feel I'm there. Because he was looking at us, one, two, three, four, five of us. He raised his horse whip, and with one signal, he signaled my mom with the baby, my grandma, and my little sister to his left. Then he looked at, at me once more, and he signaled me to the other side. This whole thing maybe took five seconds, not more. We were separated. We you know, an army brought to each other, but I never forget that I turned toward the mind. I looked her beautiful eyes, and with her eyes, she was saying, Noemi, my dear daughter, take care of yourself, be careful, I love you. That was the very last time I saw him and put him. Of course, in my heart, in my mind, always. But on my side, in a huge room, we were pushed in by the gods. And we were told we had to undress. Undress so that we leave everything on the bench. We can leave and have only our pair of shoes. Within 25 minutes, they pushed us in an other big room, and here we were toward the little shade. While I was waiting for my turn, the room had windows, and I looked in at what is there. What I did see there shocked me. They were mountains of human hair up to the ceiling precisely selected by the shade of color from previous prisoners. And then came my turn. And then sometimes I speak in fifth grade, I say they shaved our head, which is true. They didn't cut our hair, shaved. My head looked like my palm, but that was not enough. They shaved all body parts. And when this happened, our young girls, we looked at each other, where are we? What is that place? What do they want with us? But we couldn't think a lot about this either. It was within 25 minutes, another push in an other room. They locked the door behind us, and they told us that we will be having a shower. We looked up the ceiling, we did see shower heads, but nothing to open the shower with. Again, I remember the eyes were saying, maybe this is it, that's where we died. But again, we were lucky. They opened up the shower from outside, water came. After the shower, we had a pair of shoes, wet all over, no towel, no dresses, what not? A line of women gods were standing next to us, and in their arms were old dresses from previous prisoners, and they told us march. And as we were marching, they threw this rags into the air. We had to catch it. And whatever you had, you had to wear it. Now, if you had a middle-sized dress or a large dress, you were the luckiest of our students because they were heavier 
women with us and they happen to catch and get a small dress, they had to squeeze themselves in. There was no exchange in Auschwitz. And slowly we learned that Auschwitz meant. I was a prisoner, but even then I did see hundred and hundred of barracks. One about after ten barracks, a watchtower with the guard with the gun. All around us, trained German shepherd dogs were surrounding us, watching every step. And then we stopped finally in front of one barrack. We were told that each barrack has six rooms, and in each room, hundreds of us was pushed in. The room was narrow and small. So we were told, this is the place where we will be sleeping, rain or shine, from morning till night, outside. Dirt floor, when we got done, it was so crowded that we just couldn't even move. And if somebody had to go out in the dark to the latrine, we didn't see where we're stepping. We stepped up everyone. People were screaming, crying. It was horrible. Very early, both of us up. We have to line up. We were getting breakfast. We were hungry and hungry. What was the breakfast? One cup of soap or coffee and one slice of bread. They had to have learned that one slice of bread had flour in it and sawdust. One had flour, one had sawdust. We had the same thing at night. Coffee and that so far and bread. For lunch, we were told that we will have, we will have soup. Oh, fine, finally, waiting for the ball never came. The first one at the very top of the line got a big bowl. They poured the soup in. She had to drink out of it and give it over and over and over and over to the next. That soup smelled horrible. And when it got to the group I was in, we said, although we were hungry, we said, please pass it, we don't want it. Not because it smelled bad, but because we were too close to home to bring ourselves to drink after so many lips and months. As soon as we said that, the God was there. I heard that you people said no. You have to learn that you have no right to say no. You do what we tell you to do, and you don't do it. It will be something you will see. It will something else happen. We were there long enough to learn that when the Nazis say that you do this, if you don't, or else meant, we kill you. We didn't want to die. We were young, and we started to drink that thing next day. But something else happened. We were thousands and thousands of young women, young women having period every month. They didn't want to deal with the either. It just happened that when I came off 
from the cattle car. I couldn't bring anything with me. I got mine. And I had the shawl and everything. And I felt so lonely, so lost. Who should I ask what to do? The Lord? No. Thousands, thousands of us had the menstruation. And then later we learned how that why they want us to drink <coughs> that soap. Not because they want us to have soap. It was a certain medication. Within an hour after we drank all that soap, whoever had period stopped and thousands and thousands of us never had it. <coughs> and later we learned they are put in a medication in the soap because they wanted to be sure that in case we live after the body is over, we should not have kids and I know I learned that three of my friends they got free, got married, could not have kids. I was drinking the soap. I got married. I did not listen to the Nazis. Because I got married, I had two sons, five grandchildren, and eight great grandbabies. <laughs> I am We didn't have any water to drink or wash ourselves. Sometimes we used that coffee to wash our face, just to feel some wetness. Once in a while they brought in water, drinking water, in a tank and poured into the, in a basin. They even gave us a little cup and they told us to drink. You see what happened, so many people, so thirsty, we approached this basin and tried to get some water from the moving on. Mo most of them, that little one, what we got into that cup, just spilled over. And then, those of us who spoke German, we heard the Nazi gods talking. What they were saying, they were saying, look at them. They are not human beings, not even animals. They are little worms. They kill each other for water. And you heard some of the things what happened, and many more. But what was the hardest thing to endure, that we had to listen day in and day out, that we are not human beings, we just a little worm. Next time the water came in, many of us stepped back. We didn't even approach the water. We were so thirsty, but we did not want to hear that. And the Nazis in mind, we were getting to be dehydrated. We die earlier. 
But now that I am talking about water, and I didn't have it for a long time, I am getting right now really thirsty. I can't stand it anymore. You see what is there? <laughs> this is the water. And some people are saying that I am advertising water, but let me drink first. <laughs> Mm, delicious. Put them away because I will drink the whole time. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that whenever, whenever I go, they ask him, Noemi, what do you want to drink? That, that this, said, don't worry. But for me, one cup of cold, clean water is the best drink forever. Here comes the advertisement. It is good for you. And it tastes good, <laughs> and I just love it. Okay, back to Auschwitz again. We had nothing to do in this place, nothing, from morning till night outside. But the Nazis find something for us to do. Every, after every breakfast, have I call it that way, in dinner. We had to line up for three hours to be counted. There was no reason to count us because nobody could have escaped from here. The fences were electrified. We were told that some people before we were there tried to escape, they burned on it. The German shepherd dogs, the, gun, the guards with the gun, but they were counting us. What happened? People got sicker and weaker every single day. They also, we learned that by that time, our weight was between 62 and 65 pounds. We were grown ups. So people, as we were standing there, they fainted away. They fell down. They were still alive. They were picked up thrown on the truck waiting on the other side, when was piled up high, was driven away, we never saw them again. One day, although I never gave up, I never even thought or was thinking about dying <coughs> or any close to that, but I was very, very sick and I lost consciousness. How come I didn't get on this truck? Because in that horrible place in Auschwitz, I had some treasures. What could be? Friends. Friends are wonderful. Doesn't have to be Auschwitz to love it. But in my case, you know what happened? I didn't know about them, but they were telling me. One on my right, one on my left, and one behind me. As soon as they saw me falling, they decided in one second to risk their own life to save me. And one this side, this side, in back of me, they were holding me up in that one rag of me for three hours. Finally, the counting was over. They left me to sit down. I woke up and I asked what happened. They were telling me, and they were telling me also it was very hard to hold me up because my body wanted to go. But I knew that these three wonderful people saved my life. <coughs> One happy note, when I first went back to Hungary from the United States, I met one out of the three. When she saw me, she said, no, Amy, do you remember what happened to you in Auschwitz? I said, of course I do. I will be here talking to you. So we rushed to each other. We hugged, we were laughing, we were crying, we were remembering, and we did one more thing. We were celebrating life. And here I have to tell you, and it comes from deep of my heart, 
that I love life. I really do. People asking me, how come you went through all this and much more horrible things? That's why. Because I could have been killed in every second, but no, I am alive. And I consider life as a gift. Now, I'm normal. Don't think that every morning I wake up and say, what I will be happy about today. In fact, it can happen that my car doesn't start, that I break something, I get angry. But then I say to myself, no, Amy, remember, you are the one, and everything is possible. Forget about it. People asking me, how come you went through all these horrible things? Just because, because I learned that to be alive is the most important thing. Anything is hard and harder can be dealt with until you are alive. And I learned that because I was in danger in every second to die. I didn't. I appreciate that I am alive and I am not taking for granted. Well, I have to also make it sure that you believe me that when I wake up every morning, I don't start what I will be happy about today. No. I'm really living a real life. There are sometimes things happen where you get angry and angrier and even, even more angry. That's okay. But when I'm angry enough, I say, no, Amy, well, you are alive. You survived. Take care of the thing. What are you angry about? And go on living. And that's what I'm doing. That I recommend, too, not only the water. <laughs> I am not taking for granted that I am alive. I learned in Auschwitz how precious to be alive. And by talking to each other with this dear person, we realized that the only and most important thing is to be alive. Nobody has to go to Auschwitz-Birkenau to have problems. I know everybody has problems. The question is how we deal with it. And I decided, got into that horror, that I will be thankful and I will be happy to be alive. And I know that life is not so easy, but I learned in Auschwitz that if you are alive, this is the gift what you have to deal with. And that's what I'm trying to do. And it makes sense to me. Don't think, though, that I wake up every morning and say, well, I will be happy today. What, what should I be happy today about? No. I can be angry, and I'm getting angrier for certain things, and then I say, okay, solve the problem, go on living. And this is my policy. That's how I am, not only alive, but I am, for some reason, healthy, and I, with that, silver hair, I am not 28, 58, 68, more, more eight, but, but I am still okay. And maybe because I love life and I am not embarrassed to say it. We didn't know what happened to our dear ones. And so we tried to ask the guards, but it was so hard to speak. We took turns. 
Nobody answered. We asked, where are they? Finally, a woman guard came. She stopped. And she was yelling, you really want to know what happened to them? Yes, ma'am. She said, you see that gray cloud over there? We said, yes, we do see on the sky. And we are choking on something. What is it? But yes, we do see it. Then she asked, do you smell that horrible smell? Yes, ma'am, we do. In Auschwitz, they had a lot of chimneys. She pointed on one. She said, do you see the fire day and night on that chimney? Do you? Yes, ma'am. But where are they? And then she said, look at that cloud. Look at the fire. And then she said, here are your relatives. You see, here they go all the way to the fire. We thought we must be really sick, that maybe we don't understand what she is talking about. And then we learned that she told us the truth. When we got separated, they went in an other barrack. They had to undress. Then they went into the shaving too. But when they got into the so-called, that was shower room for us. For them was a gas chamber. And that's where they were pushed in, hundreds and hundreds of them. And instead, water, gas bulbs were thrown in. They exploded, and there were all the dear ones suffocated. Among them, my grandma, my mom, my little sister, my little brother, and many, many aunt and uncle and cousins. When they didn't move anymore, we were told they were put in a carrier. They were thrown in a crematoria, and they were burned. And that's why it's still in that Auschwitz, a lot of, lot of, of ashes everywhere. I was there three more weeks, smelling that, knowing that. And then the man who separated us at the beginning came again. This officer name was Dr. Joseph Mengele, the infamous man who daily sent thousands and thousands of people to death. He was there again. Why? We had to line up. And we were selected, thousands of us, in a corner. And we were told that he got a request from Germany. They needed a thousand Hungarian girls who are still alive and moving to help them in their war effort. We got prisoner outfit onto the cattle car and from Poland to Europe to Germany into an other camp. That was a Buchenwald, a huge camp, into a sub-camp. And here we were surprised. We had bomb bats. We were able to take shower. And for 10 days, we didn't work. And then, in that 10 days, we got a little bit more food, but not a lot. And during these 10 days, I will be real fast, something happened. One of my friends went around the barracks, and she found herself in the back door of the kitchen. In front of the kitchen door was a big bucket. 
we look in, she looked in, it was potato skin in it, not the raw potato, the cooked one, little flakes. But we were so hungry. She looked around, picked it up, brought it into the barrack. We had a feast. <laughs> we told her to go and go again. We sent helpers to, and for the whole ten days, we were eating the potato skin with a little different every day. We noticed that real potato was growing on it. This is an SS camp. Who is doing that? Never mind. We just had a feast. And I didn't know who did it until I came to Bellingham. I was invited to a wedding. The ceremony was done already. And we were waiting for lunch. And it was a buffet-style lunch. Next to me was a couple, the woman sitting next to me. I never did see her. I said, where are you from? She said, I am from Seattle. I said, uh-uh. That Seattle has the same accent I have. <laughs> so where are you from? From Hungary, she said. Well, we started to speak Hungarian. And I asked her, what did you do in the war? They took me to Auschwitz, she says, and then Mengele came, and we had to go, ship, they shipped us to Germany, to Buchenwald, a little camp named Allendorf. I said, stop for a second. You're telling my story. <laughs> <laughs> we were together, we never knew each other. As a slaves of the Nazis, you don't socialize. So, I said, and what did you do in that small camp? She said, nobody works for 10 days. I said, I know. But nine plus one of them, 10 of them, from the first day on, they were sent to a kitchen to peel potatoes. I said, oh my God, you were peeling potatoes in Allendorf? Do you know anything about that miracle that every single day some potato grew under the potato skin? Do you know who did it? Or did you know about it at all? By that time, she was crying and laughing. And she said, I did know about it because I was the one who did it. <laughs> Can you imagine that? He, she was my hero because she was in the SS officer's kitchen. It was a no-no to send for the prisoners a little potato, but she did it. And then it was a buffet style. I don't have to spend a lot of minutes with that. Only just say that we went through twice and piled up the food and they did the same treatment for the dessert. And our husbands were so embarrassed, <laughs> they were not included in that. When the ten days were over, they selected us out. Twenty-five of us were sent to work, and many others went to the big factory to work. And we had to march four miles to work. It was winter, no jacket, no socks, wooden shoes. We found there an engineer, a foreman, a lot of, lot of guards. And we were told that we are there to make bombs. Us, little skeletons, bombs, yes. They showed us huge, tall, very long tables on a trace, and on the trace, this size of bars, different colors and wires. And we were told that we have to work on this very carefully because this bars are poisonous chemicals. 
if we drop one of them, it will blow up. Everybody will die. For one second, we thought, maybe we kick it over, all the Nazis die. Good idea. Uh-uh, no. We don't want to die. We had to do something else. We learned what, what to do. And then we learned what to do. We learned also that whatever we made, it was sent to the factory, was put together a certain way, put in the plane, and was sent away to do what? To kill. Kill whom? Those we praying to liberate us. The, who are they? The Americans and the Allies. What should we do? We are slave workers, we are prisoners, the next room are the guards with the gun. What should we do? We had something else, but they didn't have. We spoke Hungarian, and we said to each other, you know what, let's make a little sabotage. Well, good idea. How you do it? We had fun. You know, we were color-coded. And I did this with these hands, no glove, no mask, nothing. And we did fun. We made such a mess. The green got the red, the red wire. The black got the white wire. No matching color here. We made such a mess, and we were giggling, laughing. Finally, we do something against that horrible power. And then something happened. In the next room, those SS guards heard us laughing. And I always say, excuse me, those dumb Nazis in the other room, when they heard us laughing, they thought that we are having a fun working for them. And about two months ago, I spoke in the Germany, um, in the library, and then I got to this and I said, oh, we guarantee that it won't explode. One man was sitting in the first row, an old man, and he said, I know, I know. I said, sir, excuse me. He said, I was in the army. The bombs were falling. No, nothing exploded. I said, that must have been my bomb. I will be a witness until I can move. 
So nobody should tell me it didn't happen. The third reason is very personal. You see, I don't know where are the ashes of my dear one in this huge, huge camp. I don't even have a grave to go to. So whenever I speak about them and their, about their horrible fate, I feel I give my love to them and honoring them. And all of you here who are listening to me now, helping me to do this, and I thank you. We worked seven months, and finally we made a mess as much as we could. They opened the gates out. We rested down in a forest, and all the SS, everybody came with us. When we left that forest, we had a surprise. All SS officers, guards, were in civilian clothes. What happened to the uniform? They left it in the forest. That gave us an idea. They might, must know that the Allies coming closer. So we got to the highway. They want us to make that march from here, the other end of Germany. And then as we were marching, more and more, 12 of us, I don't know how we got the courage, we did see a thick forest, and one by one, slowly, we disappeared. We were waiting in a forest, all of a sudden we heard steps, a soldier was coming, uh -uh. they discovered us. But the soldier was not a German soldier. The soldier was an American soldier. He asked, How, who speaks English? Mm -mm. Hungarian and German. He spoke very well German. He was from Patton's army. He said, you will hear gunshot. You will see fire. Don't be afraid. I have to leave now, but I will come back. Next day, that dear man came back. I will never, ever forget his face. I will never forget his voice. And I definitely will never forget what he said. He said, you are all free. This part of Germany surrendered. Here we are, 12 little skeleton girls, and we jumped him, <laughs> all of us, 12 of us. We kissed him, hugged him, we didn't want to let him go. He said, don't suffocate me, you still need me. He took us to the headquarters, they took our names, and then into a barrack, and this barrack had real food in it. We wanted to eat everything. The American doctor came, slow down. Your digestive system it doesn't know what to do with the food. You can die when you are free. It was hard, but we made it. This was in April. In September, I was back in Hungary, and here I learned that my father survived. We met. I had to tell him what happened to his dear ones. What I told you at the beginning, we were crying, grieving, but then we discovered and was thinking my mom would not like that. Get out to life. He was a teacher and principal went back to school, I got married, I had two sons, 
and then I went to college, I became a teacher. I was still in Germany, May the 8th, 1945, when the peace broke out in Europe. The war was not over. Here I have to stop because we're getting out of time, only I have to make two comments. Many people asking me if I have hate in me, and I say a big no. Why? Because I learned in Auschwitz, hate is killing everyone. Prejudice, bigotry, hate is wrong. If I would have hate in my heart now, I would not be free. I would be the prisoner of my own hate. That is not working with me anymore. I am a free woman who has learned that bigotry, prejudice, and hate is wrong. We have to find a way. And I am doing what? What I can do is that almost every single day telling people what is Auschwitz-Birkenau, what is hate, and what is killing each other means. Here I have to really stop, only I have to tell you and thank you that you were listening. As you see, I don't have notes. Everything is up here and in my heart. And this makes me able to look. And I did see a lot of you, the eyes of you. You were with me. You were with me and you were sorry and you were happy with me. I thank you so much. Thanks. Remembering is not enough. We have to remember and act on it. And that's why I think that my story and the stories of the million innocent people should serve as a stop sign for our generation and for all generations to come. Because prejudice, discrimination, hate goes unchecked. The end of it is destruction in that. And that is a lesson I learned and has to be learned in the Auschwitz school of hatred. I am not so naive that thing that everything is absolutely fine because Holocaust is over. I know that a lot of, lot of anti-Semites are, that there are people who are suffering, Darfur, and everywhere of different kind of Holocaust. And if we we cannot save the whole world, but if we think and know that there is a need for us to act, and not only about the Holocaust, anything what happens, which we think is wrong, to take part. And I hope that the Holocaust as a study will help people then to act on the problem what they have then. That's what I think. Thank you. It is not easy to share the pain and relive it. But there is a lesson to learn. When I look and in your eyes, when I saw the compassion, the love, the respect, the sympathy, uh, it felt it was healing. And I guess so, I can recommend that if you, yourself, 
have some pain, something troubling you, find someone who can you, you can trust and tell what you feel. It, you will notice it's healing. I am a proof of that. I lived, excuse me, in hell on earth. But I was going on. I didn't stop. When you have experienced some pain, some trouble, think of having hope and don't please give up. And I know I cannot bring back my dear ones. But what I can do that when I speak about them, I am honoring them. I am sending my love to them. And I am thanking you that you invited me to come. And I was able to give them my dear ones, my love.